So we got all those old selection sets and stuff like that. I'm going to go through and actually just knock out this one and replace it with a new one. Now the truth is, actually, let me tell you this. When you're going through and updating your files, it's better form for you actually to save them under the same name. Because if you save them under the same precise name, next time you open up Navisworks, it'll just load in that file automatically. You won't lose anything. In fact, if you've translated the file around, it'll keep the translation. It'll kind of keep everything. Better to kind of keep on doing it that way. Since I have too many files open, and some of you have it open with me, I can't write it over. It just won't let me do a file write to it. So that's why I'm doing this. But for you, just save them out right on top of the old name and update it that way. And every once in a while, you make copies just to make sure that you have a kind of an archival backup copy. But let me append this now. I'll swap in that class 3B. Say OK. And this is going to look not at all dissimilar from what it looked like before. The difference, though, is, and it's hard to see here. This still looks about the same. doesn't look like anything really changed. But if we go to the Properties tab, which we don't really spend much time on, you'll find that there's now an element property called 4D Task ID. Now, let's talk about this for a second. If you go through and add your 4D task IDs and you just export it right away without putting any values in here, you won't find anything because it only shows you the ones where you actually have valid values in there. Okay, so if you want to go through, if you, you know, try to do it and you're not seeing anything, make sure you actually put some values in back in Revit before you did the export. Okay, and those will come across. But what is the effect of doing this? It is as follows. These are all actually little search sets. So I can, if I choose, I kind of pop on out of there. Everything looks a little bit blue right now, doesn't it? Okay. If I choose all those, or I choose all those, actually, let's see. Let me see if I can get my background not looking so blue. No. Da, 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 da. There we go. There's all the one tens. There's all the one twenties. The 130s, the 140s, the 220s, the 320s. Okay, so you can see I actually have these different sets. They're ready to kind of go mapping on in there. So what do I need to do? Okay, I got that timeline. I want to go through and as attach a selection set to each of the different things. For each of these different guys here, like this 110, need to select it. If you want to say find items, you can actually see how it's defined. It's really just 4D task ID equals 110. And close that back up again. But with those selected, I'm going to right click and say just add the current search and give it the name 110. Same thing over here. I'm going to add that current search and give it the name 120. I'm going to add that current search and give it the name 130. You can guess what I'm going to call that one. Okay, I'll get the 220s and the 320s. I wish there was a way to automate that. I haven't yet figured out a good way to automate. It seems like you have a search set. I ought to be able to put it right down there. And when one of you finds out how to figure that, please let me know because it'll make uh, this look a lot easier. Add current search, and I'll finally say 320. Yeah, I want to just drag that in there. I so badly want to drag that in there, but it won't let me do that. Okay. So I got these different selection sets. These selection sets are now going to select the different items that I want. So what do you do with all that? You go back to the timeliner, which was just waiting for you to have some selection sets. And instead of mapping everything individually, one painful element at a time, you're going to go to those first floor slabs and over here say that, you know, those should be mapped into the 110s. The first floor columns should be mapped into, and we'll attach the set of the 120s. The first floor beams will be mapped into the 130s, and again, the first floor joists will be mapped to the 140s. So where are those numbers all coming from? It's really just the scheme that I set up over in the spreadsheet. So there's really nothing magical. It's just sort of there. Let me get the second floor columns in there, too, since I did get some of them. Those were going to be my 220s and my third floor columns are my 320s. Okay, Let me pause right there for just a minute. Kind of say, okay, 
This whole idea of this, uh, associating the values and selecting based on the values. Let's see how that's resonating with people, because if nothing else, I want you to get that. So does that sort of make sense about sort of assigning the values back in Revit, and then over here searching and finding things based on those values? Yeah. Just gonna, just, you know, general nods, yes, no, unclear. It'll become much clearer when you try to do it on your own. Right, here's the it. But it's, uh, that's the key, is really right in there. It's really go out, grab that, assign the values, and then use those values to do your selection over here. Because the last part of this, of how we actually make a construction simulation, that's really easy. If you've got a timeline and you've got search sets, the, the construction simulation, that's not going to happen just automatically. Okay, so if you had trouble with that, and that went by a little bit fast, the best source of information, other than listening to this entire lecture again, which of course you would love to do, is if you go on out to, it's in the BIM curriculum. We sent out a link the other day. It's Unit 7, Lesson 2. It goes through this and kind of does the whole little thing in about 20 minutes. So you know you can sort of follow that back. And Demi will attest to what a fabulous presentation it is. Hey, hey. Well, not really. But it's like, <laughs> he feels pressured to say that since he's actually here on the spot. So uh, you can go through and, yeah, because we tried to encapsulate this and put it into a little lesson to share with people. Okay, so with all that stuff hanging around out there, you are ready now to create the simulation. And this is the part, it's so, it's like falling off a log. It's so easy, you just do it and it kind of works. And let's show you how it works. You got tasks, you got different items attached to the tasks, that's all good. The final step is really straightforward. We have all these kind of funky things we can change about the simulation, and I'm not going to advocate that you change any of these. Most of the defaults are kind of A-OK. -okay. There's this whole notion of really for each of the different types of activities. Oh, construction activities, they start out 90% transparent. They come in in green. At the end of the task, they show up in sort of whatever the color is that they should be in the model. Oh, demolition activities show up in red. There's like all these different sort of things that you can change, but for the most part, temporary activities are yellow. For the most part, I'd leave all that stuff alone. Rules, let's talk about that. Rules is kind of a very nice little feature where if you're really, really good, and you might have noticed that my tasks have a unique field called task ID or index, okay, which just happens to match against that search field there. If you want to have it to automatically link things based on that, you can set up a rule that will do it. Or you can say, edit the rule. And you can say, map tasks from the column index to selection sex with the same name. That will speed it up a little bit. So if you want to have it kind of map that in there so you don't have to attach them all individually, that will speed things up. But when you get all done, you come to the select simulate tab. And here's where you make the final choices. Right now, we're looking at day zero. It's the pre-construction phase right now, 0% progress. This is going to start moving forward as we move forward in time. But we are going to set up just a few parameters for the simulation under settings. And they're as follows. We can go ahead and change the start and end dates so we're not using sort of what's in the task timeline. We can push it out in time and move it forward or move it backward if we want to have a different start and stop date. We can choose the playback duration and the interval size. Let's talk about how they work together. A 20 second animation goes by pretty quick. <laughs> kind of rolls right on through. You might miss what you want to see there. So if you would like to go ahead and slow that down a little, I usually slow it down to 60 seconds or 90 seconds. It's you know, Slower may be a little bit better for presentation. You decide how much your audience wants to see it and what level of detail they want to see it. You also have the interval size. As a percentage, if you do something at every 5%, it's going to present 20 snapshots. So every 5%, it's going to show you a snapshot. If you prefer not to have just 20 snapshots, but you want to show day by day, or week by week, or month by month, whatever it is, you can choose a different interval right here. Let's say days, and I'll say, oh, let's just do it every day, or every two days, whatever it is that you want to sort of set it up. But that's all there is to it, is we're going to go through and set up those two things. You can control whether you want to show actual dates versus planned dates. And we're going to stay with the actual dates in terms of what it's showing over here. We can also control what's happening with the title of the window when it's doing the animation. I'll just leave it at that for now. We can also go through and kind of put an animation in here. Uh, we'll leave that alone for now in terms of what's going on. Let me say OK to these things. 
And all we need to do is say play and start the simulation and watch what happens. Okay, we're at day six, day eight, day ten. Notice what's happening is down here in the time ladder window, it's showing you which activity is being constructed right now. And over here in the animation window, you're actually seeing it being built. Okay, and slowly but surely, as it goes marching on through, there was a big gap in there, and that has to do with the fact that we really didn't define much activity on level two. We only define level one right now. So we've got a couple columns in level two. I'm doing level two beams right now, and I just haven't mapped any activities to it. The joists theoretically are happening now. And again, I haven't mapped any excuse me, um, model elements to it. But now when I get up to level three, the floor deck, we don't have anything. But finally, on columns, a few things pop up. So why does this simulation look funny? It's because I just haven't finished mapping all my elements. If I map the rest of the elements to the timeline, they'll start showing up in there too. But what this gives you the ability to do is as follows. Okay, we'll get to the end of the project, and there it is built. We can stop it. I can drag this little slider along so I can sort of see at any point in time what the project's going to look like. So there it is on Valentine's Day. Coming up on the start of spring or out into May. You can sort of pull to wherever you want to be and sort of see what the project should look like. Now, this is useful in a couple different ways. Again, what people tend to do with this is they'll go through and they'll spot things that are just physically impossible, where you have two things in the same place or something that can't get through some sort of uh, physical relationship. So it's good for spotting that. It also tends to be good when you replay it. You know, you'll often sort of spot different things where it doesn't look like there's a whole lot going on. And that may be a sign to you that there's a chance to optimize and improve things a little bit for the construction schedule. For example, a really nice thing to think about doing on this building, although it's not a very big building, but something we often do on bigger buildings is, for example, if you look at that whole structure, you know, maybe it doesn't really make sense to wait for the entire first floor column system to go in before you start putting beams in there. Maybe we could actually start thinking about the building as being a series of different segments, and we can sort of start constructing segment A with B and C following it. So we can start breaking down tasks and say that, well, maybe as soon as we get the first few rows of columns done, we can start putting those beams in as we're continuing to erect the columns over here. And then as these get erected, we can start putting those beams in and erect the columns over here. So this whole notion of more of a location-based schedule where, as opposed to waiting for the entire floor to be done, you sequence things and sort of bring them in a little bit closer to each other often saves a lot of uh, time on the overall project. So for the construction folks, you'll recognize it as being one of the techniques that are really, you know, the more finely you can chunk it down and sequence it, that usually the better. And what you're looking for is sort of a smooth flow as opposed to waiting on things. So the construction simulations are good at doing that. They're also very good. You know, there's actually some research being done right now, which is looking at really taking visual representations like what the model should look like at this point in time and actually having video cameras mounted on the site and doing comparisons so that we can actually uh, compare what was expected versus what's actually going on in the field. Okay, and then based on that, actually update the schedule. Because cameras and uh, re you know, recognition of ab objects is actually getting incredibly good in terms of going through and mapping these things. So this whole notion of doing 4D simulation has an awful lot of different uses at the tail end of it. And it's actually pretty easy to do. Once you go through and get a timeline and the tasks associated, you can really go through and show whatever you want. For example, this view right here is, oh, just this funny perspective out on the side. If I wanted to instead orbit that around or like even focus on a specific element of the building, I'll zoom on in to something that I really want to specifically see and I'll pan that up and whatever it is that I really want to see being built. I can go through and still run the simulation, change the simulation, and just sort of understand it from a different viewpoint. You can change the viewpoint to really be whatever you want or hide or show different elements as you want to, because the idea of the elements and when they're going to appear in time, that happens quite, in, it, it's really independent of the viewpoint. Okay, so let me, I'll pan on down further, and I'll orbit that so I could actually look up and sort of see what's going on as this thing's being built. So 
Use this in whatever way is going to make the most sense in terms of it's all just giving you more of a time-based view so you understand the project better, and you can plan accordingly. Yes? Uh, so we're, we're doing this for, for both the structural elements and the architectural elements or exterior walls? Yeah. For, for the assignment, do it this way. Do the structural elements. Do all oh, that basic structural skeleton. For the architectural elements, keep it real simple. You can go ahead and bring in the architectural elements just as like the second floor exterior walls, the second floor windows, you know, put a roof on it, but it's pretty much the skin elements. Okay, so don't worry about any of the interior walls, any of the interior doors, the stairways, any of that stuff. Because necessarily with this whole project, you're not really doing the entire building. We're not estimating the entire building. You know, only go ahead and simulate the things that we're focusing on, which are the structural skeleton and the building skin. Okay, so you'll do a little bit of that to the structural. You'll also have to kind of do a few elements out of the architectural model and bring them together. But yeah, they're pretty easy to get to. Architectural elements in the construction tree. Yeah, if you start messing around with just the whole notion of the walls and stuff like that, you can come up with a pretty easy selection set to get those. Okay, other questions about what's going on here? Is that enough to get you going? Okay, if that's enough to get you going, let us go ahead and break for today. There's no reason to kind of belabor it. You can go ahead and like uh, just start playing with that. And again, the idea, oh, final thing. Let me, now there's always one more thing. I always forget something. You want to be able to sort of export this in some form, right? That's always a good thing. How do you get this out at the tail end? You go through and you say export, and you export an animation. Then you can say what to do. Let me do the timeliner. I'll take it out as a Windows AVI file. Okay, that'll just be a little Windows movie file that you can give us back. And that'll take that so you can replay it or send it around to the appropriate people that need to see it. So that's all it is in terms of exporting it. Okay, and that'll finish it up in terms of oh, the height and the width, yada, 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 whatever's going on, say okay. Sure. And I'll make a movie out of that. Okay. That'll kind of wrap us up then. Okay, so let us break for today. Go ahead and dive on in. If your job is the construction task, go ahead and like see if you can make it through that with a very simple kind of model. Again, don't go down to like 40 or 50 elements. Keep it like, you know, you're looking 20 to 30 max. Keep it pretty simple about what you're doing because we just really want you to get the experience of working with a timeliner. And uh, yeah, see if you can sort of come up with a reasonable like uh, approximation for how this building is going to get built.